Hello, friends. This is another live show called Forsaking My Father's Religion. You know, in this on this channel, we interview Muslims from all sort of backgrounds, from all sort of um, countries, languages, because I believe it all in my heart. There is an army of ex-Muslim rising in this last days that they will change the Middle East and they will change the Muslim world. They know the language, they know the culture, and they're an unstoppable force in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. So watch out. They are coming on this channel. You just watch the testimonies. They're Sunnis, Shias. They are from um, Farsi-speaking world, Arab-speaking world, all sort of places. And we are so glad that today on this show we have Brother Hussein. Brother Hussein, it's an honor for me to have you here. I love um, I, I watched your testimony before what I said. I have to have you here to interview you and my audience get a chance to hear what the Lord Jesus has done for you. Brother, tell us where you come from. What's your story? Thank you. It's an honor for me to be on here. I'm really, I love watching uh, the testimonies on your program. They're, uh, um, it, it's so powerful when, uh, when an ex-Muslim interviews the next Muslim, just because you know the intricacies, you know where they're coming from, mm -hmm. you know the reality of the price that that a lot of people have to pay to follow the Lord Jesus. So uh, it's been a real blessing to, to, uh, to hear uh, the testimony from you. And thank you for having me on. And my name is, uh, my legal name is uh, a famous Shiite name. You know, most people think when I tell them my name, they usually think I'm a Shiite. You know, <laughs> Your Shia name, yes. The, the, um, uh, the third uh, grandson of the self-claimed prophet of Islam, Hussein. Yeah. I used to beat myself, uh, brother, for Hussein a whole lot. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the... Uh, my father actually is Sunni. He, uh, he was he passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, he was Sunni. His name is Musa, you know Moses, and uh, and we're Palestinian. We're from the West Bank, and uh, or my father is. You know, my mother, my father, like many Palestinians, went to Brazil in the late '50s, where he met my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother was Catholic, and still is. And, uh, so, so a Catholic married a Sunni Muslim. You know what? Palestine, Palestine, right? Very, very common situation that's happening a lot more wow. these days. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness! Uh, the uh, the amount of uh, like in the middle in um, the Central America, South America, mm -hmm. the amount of uh, you know they say that you know if you heard Yasser Qadi say that uh, the number one way Islam grows among Christians or so-called Christians is through love jihad, you know, which is, you know, that they marry uh, a Muslim man. And that's happening a lot. And, uh, you know, I hope somehow, you know, we can shed light on this situation to, you know, help uh, warn women that, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in a... Uh, um, I, I got a, a thing here. I don't know. Do I have to do something? No, everything, everything looks good. Okay, it's a, I got its message saying that uh, Oops, we lost Brother Hussein. I'm just going to remove him from the scene and hopefully his internet gets connected back. So, um, oh, he's back. Praise the Lord. Brother, Steve, Brother Hussein, can you hear us? Okay. He'll be back. <laughs> Folks, it's a live show and things such as this will happen. Brother Hussein, are you back? You are. Go oh. ahead. You know what? Yep. It could be the uh, weak Wi-Fi or internet problem. But we speak to that Wi-Fi in the name of the Lord Jesus. We speak to that signal to work properly that this testimony would be heard and heard clearly so folks it is a live show and these things could happen 
I am waiting for Brother Hussein to show up. He's here. Brother, are you ready? Okay. Um, I just want to tell you that on my, on my screen, it says reload and log in. It looks like you are no longer connected to the system. Please log in again. No, now, good. I'm good. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what's happening there. So anyway. Don't touch before, anything. <laughs> yeah, I won't touch anything. <laughs> so anyway, but, uh, but, but anyway, there are many, many Palestinians in the late 50s and still into the 60s that started going to Brazil to marry uh, Brazilian women. And they, and the Brazilian woman at that time was like a visa to America. Wow. And so if you marry a Brazilian woman, he instantly gets you to America. And that's what happened with my family and many of my uncles uh, uh, did the same thing. And uh, so they came to America in 1961. And it, I was born in 1963 in, uh, in California. And uh, even though my mother and father are different religions, when, uh, when I was born, my uh, father asked my mother, uh, he asked my mother, what religion are the kids going to be, you know? And uh, my sister's name is Fatima, by the way, another famous Shiite name. And, and, uh, and my mother said, they'll be like you, you know? And uh, so we were brought up nominal Muslims, you know, we didn't eat pork, we didn't, uh, we didn't go to church, didn't have Bibles, didn't have pictures of Jesus in the house, you know, you know that, that was pretty much all it meant for us. But we, I always knew there was something different about us, you know, here in the U.S. I knew that, I mean, like I said, we never go to church, I, you know. As I grew up, I realized that a lot of my friends in the United States went to church, and, but I wasn't allowed to go to church. And, uh, and so I knew there was something different. My dad was illiterate, you know. He did not know how to read and write. He grew up, he was a shepherd boy uh, in his village, and so he never went to school. And... Uh, never learned to read or write or anything. so and, and by the way our village in the west bank is, is very uh, popular in the book of joshua in the book of joshua it talks about a village called ai mm -hmm. well ai is now my village my village is, is the the name of it now i'm not going to say it just because i'm going to get it i'm already in so much trouble with my family but our, our village is the village of AI, and we have the ruins of AI there, and it's right next to Bethel, which is uh, called Bethine, very close to Jerusalem. Anyway, that's a, a little bit of trivia there. So. And, uh, and so I grew up here in the U.S., wasn't, didn't know too much about Islam, even though I knew that we were, we were Muslims, and... Uh, but uh, when my when I turned nine years old, my mother uh, left our family, mm -hmm. and when she left our family, my father was scared that she would come back and take my sister and me from him. So he took us to the Holy Land, to his village, and uh, he he took us there and he left us there for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he got married to another woman there. You know, he did the Islamic divorce, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot <laughs> to my mother and married another woman, a Muslim. And mm -hmm. uh, and she raised us for three years. My father left us there for three years, but he came back to America. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was there, I went to school and I learned Arabic, learned to read and write Arabic. I learned to speak Arabic. I didn't know any Arabic before then. And I also learned Islam. And uh, I was uh, I was very interested in. I always loved Jesus as a kid. You know, I'd seen a few movies about him, and so I'd always, even though I wasn't a Christian, I loved Jesus. I loved the, the way he was so kind, so powerful, so wonderful, and, mm -hmm. and the way uh, everybody loved him. And and so I always want to know about Jesus, but uh, my mom never told me about. Him because she didn't want to make problems in the family. You know, she had agreed that we would be brought up as Muslims. And so she didn't, she didn't ever, uh, she didn't ever tell me uh, about it. You know, she didn't want to make problems. But one day I kept pestering her because I wanted to know about Jesus. And uh, this is like when I was seven years old and I kept pestering her. 
Where they do that to you? One day she said, you know what, just get a Bible from the library, the public library, and read it. And so I got a Bible, and it, was, it had pictures in it of Jesus and stuff. And, uh, and I was reading it, and I, I know it was the Gospel of John. I read the Gospel of John. And one day, I sat down on my sofa, I was like seven years old, and I sat down and I read the Gospel of John. And I read the whole thing. I couldn't put it down, you know. I didn't understand a lot of it, but I... I love Jesus so much, and and uh, and I was really so drawn to him, and I wanted to know about him. And, uh, and then I read about the part where they wanted to kill him, and he's and nobody explained to me why did they want to kill Jesus, you know. And I kept rereading the part about the people that wanted to kill him. I kept reading that over and over again because I wanted to. Find uh, what did Jesus do? Maybe he did something wrong, and I just didn't read it. So I, I, I read it again just to, to see maybe Jesus did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't know why did they want to kill him, you know, I didn't understand. And uh, and I just uh, I read it, I couldn't, and then finally I just I went ahead and read about the crucifixion. But you know what? I I don't know why, but for some reason I didn't understand. I didn't fully understand that it was Jesus that was killed. Uh, you know, nobody explained. There were some big words in there like crucify, uh, tomb, words that we don't usually use. And so that it was uh, it was a little bit hard to understand, you know, the story. And uh, and so, but I read it and I knew that it uh, was talking about the king of the Jews and they were saying crucify the king of the Jews and stuff. and. Uh, and so uh, I read it, and then I read where he comes back to life. And I remember thinking after I read it, I said, wow, this is awesome. Because I was seven years old, and I was just beginning to learn about death. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, wow, this is awesome. If somebody dies, just put their body on a rock for three days, and they come back to life. You know, because I thought this was for everybody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, nobody explained it to me, you know, what it meant, you know. And, uh, and then um, then I drew a picture of, uh, of Jesus on the cross. I drew a picture. I got a pen and, a, and I drew it on the paper, you know, a picture of Jesus on the cross. And I showed it to my mom. And my mom said, your dad's not going to like that. And, and at that point, I realized, you know, for some reason, I kind of knew that my dad wasn't going to like it. But I didn't really understand why. But, you know, two years later, my mom left. And when she left, like I said, we went back, we went to the Holy Land. Uh, and uh, our village is in the West Bank. And I started going to Madrasa, went to the school, started learning Arabic and everything. And I really wanted to know about Jesus. You know, my dad took me to all the holy sites. He took me to the Church of the Nativity. He took me to the Church of the Holy Sites. All these places. Just for him, it was just like a tourist attraction. You know? He didn't really, you know, think about it as a Christian. You know? And uh, and I'd see all these pictures of Jesus and, and you know pictures of him on a cross and him being crucified. And, and and when I went to the village, you know, my village of course is 100 percent Muslim. And and I just I asked my uncle to. My cousin said, what do you say about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And they told me, they said, Jesus is an amazing prophet, but his name isn't Jesus. His name is Asa. Okay? He's a wonderful prophet. He's such a great prophet. Oh, we love him so much. <laughs> you know, he's so important. And, uh, and he says, and but he's not the son of God. Mm -hmm. He's a great, great, great prophet. It's not the same. And then, and he, and uh, we soon found out that he didn't die. Either. You know when? Uh, you know they were told me that when they came to arrest him, uh, God took him to heaven and made somebody else look like him, and that person was crucified. And you know I didn't know any better. You know, and like I said, uh, you know, nobody had explained to me the story. And so I accepted that. I said, okay, well, at least now I know what happened, you know? And uh, and I was 100% convinced that this is the truth. Just like 
you know how Muslims are. They're so convinced that they are right, you know. And uh, and they told me, you know, the Christians they changed the Bible, and the Jews changed the Bible. And I had an uncle, his name was Mahmoud, and he's wonderful. I love him so much, you know. And uh, he's he was a Hajj and he's the first Hajj in our family and everything. And, but he, t he he used to tell us this story. He said there was a guy who went, uh, he wanted to find out the truth. So he went to a church and he started reading the Bible, but he changed a few words. And no, none of the Christians said anything. Then he went to a synagogue of the Jews and he read the Torah and he changed a few words. Nobody said anything. But then he went to a mosque and he started reading the Quran and he changed a few words. And the Muslim said, no, you cannot change God's word. And he said, this is the truth. Islam is the truth because Muslims won't let the Quran be changed. <laughs> so, so, Brother Hussein, if you change one Bible in one church, you change all of the Bibles in all churches in all languages. This is the conclusion. It, it, all all 50 billion bibles in the world have been changed because of <laughs> that is very that's an islamic logic right there for you <laughs> well you know what uh, i know you I, i'm sure you've heard of fakhriddin al-razi mm -hmm. and, and al-razi says i mean al-razi is our best argument against this this craziness he said that once a book has been widely distributed it's important possible to do impossible because you have to go to every house and every church get all the christians to agree get all the jews to agree get you know to, to in every make language. Language. absolutely you know? in every language, in every but, language. Uh, that that's the that's the miracle of usman but that's for another day so usman <laughs> did the same thing so let's go back to this story so please continue and then um uh, after the, uh, uh, you realize that the Bible has changed and Jesus is not the Son of God. So what else? You know, you know what happened is that uh, uh, I started. Uh, you know, I be I, I became. I became. You know, there's a there's a situation that happened one time where uh, there there was this uh, this little picture of a crown, mm -hmm. and it was on a plastic coin. It was a picture of a crown, you know, like a king wears. And it was so pretty with blue behind it and red crown, like a king's crown. And I, I put a string in it and I, I made a necklace of it. And I was wearing this, this crown in the village. And my dad was still there at the time. And I had to go to the barber shop that day because I had hair back then. And uh, I was getting, and I, as I was sitting in the barber seat, the barber starts looking at the picture of the crown. And he starts saying something. And I didn't understand Arabic yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is when I first got there. And I didn't understand Arabic yet. But then all the men in the barbershop come up and they start looking at the picture on my necklace. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And my dad was there. And then when we left, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, why was everybody looking at my necklace? And he wouldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. And then I said, Dad, tell me, why was everybody looking, talking about my necklace? I didn't understand what they were saying. What did they say? He said, there's a cross on it. You know, it's a, the crown had a little cross on the top. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized there's a problem with the cross. Mm -hmm. And I took that necklace off and I threw it away. And I understood at that point, there's something wrong with the cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, and see, and that's when the change really started happening in my life. And I became, you know, because I'm just, I'm just naturally religious. I love religion. I love all that. And so I just started learning about Islam, about Muhammad, about all these things. And, and I just became very committed to Islam. And I was, I was so concerned. I wanted to come back to America to preach to Christians so that they would become Muslims. I was worried. Of, I mean, I was sincerely very sincerely scared for my Christian friends that they're going to hell. And so I wanted to come back. I, I even uh, I had a little sermon that I wanted to do in uh, in school. I wanted to tell everybody, uh, all the Christian Americans say, look, you guys, uh, the Jews believe in Moses and the Christians believe in Moses and Jesus. But Muslims, we believe in Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. So you should become Muslims. 
<laughs> that's a powerful truth right there. Uh, you know, but yes. hey, that's some heavier stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I was so I was very committed, very convinced, very anti-Christian, and uh, and then when I was eleven years old, my mother made my dad bring us back mm -hmm. because you know what he did uh, you know i don't like to, to use this word you know i don't you know it's a, it's a bad word to use but it was it was kind of like a kidnap you know that he took us there for three years without her permission and uh so he had to bring us back he did bring us back and when he brought us back you know i was i was about 12 years old at the time and i continued going to school I, you know i spoke real good English, so it was real easy for me to get back into school. But every time I'd walk by a church, I would spit at it. You know, I hated churches, you know, and whenever I'd walk by a church, because there's many churches on the way to school, I would always spit at it. <laughs> and I was so anti-Christian, and I tried to, I tried to tell Christians about Muhammad and about the glory. My, my city, it's in California, it's in Northern California, there weren't any Muslims. I, you know, I was like, I was the only Muslim like in the school, you know, it was almost all, you know, Catholics and Christians and stuff. And, uh, and then, um, uh, then in 1978, um, I was, uh, I was all alone at the house and I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if I could just say one little thing here about, please, uh, about Jesus and Muhammad, mm -hmm. you know, that, I really tried to like Muhammad. <laughs> you know the way you love Jesus? You, you see that he, when he sees a blind person, he heals him, makes him see. When he sees a, a dead person, he raises him. When he sees a hungry person, he feeds 5,000 of them. When he's, you know, when, he, when people crucify him, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It, it's hard not to love Jesus. No. His glory, his, you know, all the... But it's really hard to love Muhammad. <laughs> you know, you're not talking about me, brother, do you? Are you? No, 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 no not you. <laughs> no, the capital M. You, your namesake. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I thought there's really nothing that I like about Muhammad. You know, I really want to like him. I know I'm supposed to like him. I'm supposed to love him, but there's really not a lot that I love. I mean, he was violent. He was he was a warrior. He used to do battles, and I know those that they talk about that. Like, wow, that's such a great thing. But you know, when you when you see the beauty of Jesus, and you compare that to the violence of Muhammad, it was like it was so hard to love him. It was, you know, even though I was a Muslim, and I wanted to love him, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't really love him. You know, I it was just I was obligated to love him. You know, and uh, but when I was 15 years old, you know, I was watching television. It was. Uh, it was the it was the night before Easter, in 1978, and uh, I was watching a television program, and and there was a preacher, you know, because I used to like to hear about Jesus, you know, I'd like to hear people talk about Jesus, even if it was Christian, and this guy's name is Oral Roberts. He was a famous healing evangelist. Uh, he died about ten years ago too, and uh, he was talking about Jesus coming back to life, and you know, because it was Easter, you know. And while he was talking, the Holy Spirit just fell on me. It was like, boom. It was just like, bam. You know, and I looked up and Jesus was right there. And, you know, I didn't see him with my eyes, but I know he was right there. And I said, Jesus. And when he came, I knew that he's the son of God. Mm -hmm. I know what the Quran says. I know what we were taught that Allah has no sons. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not the Son of God. And the great sins, the greatest sin is to should you know to say that. But when he came, I knew he's the Son of God. You know, it was instant. I knew him. And it was like the Holy Spirit was inside of me. Jesus was right there. I think he baptized me in the Holy Spirit. You know, he came and he baptized me in the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. And I tell you what, you know, it wasn't like I was uh, a Muslim and I became a Christian. I was dead and I came to life. Amen. You know, 
it, uh, it was like, um, you know, in Islam, I wanted, I wanted that life. I wanted that peace. I wanted that joy. I never had. It. Allah didn't give me nothing. But the minute Jesus came, He gave it to me. And this is this is almost what forty years ago, forty five years ago actually. And uh, and He's still here. He hasn't, left, he hasn't left me, you know. And the Bible uh, says He never leaves us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. That is the truth. That's in the book, book of Hebrews. Hallelujah. He never leaves us nor forsake us. Did I say Hebrews? Hey, it's James. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, I just, uh, I, I, it was so powerful. It was so miraculous. It was so instant. And uh, there was nobody in the house. So, you know, there was nobody, you know, because my dad used to go work on the weekend. So I was alone, all alone at the house. And I didn't have anybody to tell. But you know what? Um, I wasn't wearing a shirt because it was hot. And so what I did is I went into the bathroom and I got this toothpaste. This toothpaste is called close up and it's red, you know? And I made a big cross on my chest. <laughs> it's my way of saying I am a Christian, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it, it, you know, it was instant like that. It was a miracle and I can't deny it. If I say it didn't happen, I'd be a liar, you know? This is what happened to me, and it was a miracle. I know God doesn't do that with everybody, but He did do that with me, and uh, and I just praise Him. I thank Him that He came to me, you know, uh, in that wonderful way. And you, you know, when Jesus came, it was like I knew Him. It was like He was an old friend, you know. It was like I knew Him before. When He came, it was just like, oh, you know, it was just like He wasn't a stranger. I knew Him. You know, I knew him from before, you know, and, and I think it was because of when I read the Bible when I was a little kid, you know, and, 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 and I, I just felt his presence, you know, that uh, that I instantly knew him when he came to me. And so anyway, so then uh, I, I, I went to the church that I used to spit at all the time <laughs> on, the, on Monday. And, you know, and I uh, I talked to the pastor there and I said, hey, you know, this happened to me and all this. He was, he, and he, he told me, you know, uh, he told me the, back then they used to have what's called the four spiritual laws. You know, you're a sinner, God loves you, you died for you, you have to receive him. And so I prayed and received the Lord and, you know, and he gave me a little Bible, a gospel mm -hmm. of God. And so I started reading it. And, uh, but I did not tell my dad yet that I had become. And, uh, but uh, uh, soon after that, I told my sister and she was a Muslim and, uh, and she told my dad. <laughs> and uh, there was a one day where I came, I was out with friends and that night I came home and my dad and my sister were sitting in the sofa and my dad said, sit down, sit down. Sat down. He says, uh, we're family, aren't we? I said, of course. He said, we're uh, Arabs, aren't we? I said, of course we're Arabs. And then he said, we're Muslims, aren't we? And I remember where Jesus said, if you deny me, four men, I'll deny it before the Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I said, I said, no, Dad, I'm not a Muslim. He said, why? I'm happy this you know, and uh, you know, he took a shoe and he threw it at me <laughs> and he kicked me out, you know. But then, before I reached the door, he grabbed me and he, he started trying shaking me and trying to bring me back to Islam, you know, how it is, you know. And uh, start telling me how great Islam is, and Muhammad, it's the last religion, it's the last book, and uh, Christianity has been changed, and you know, all the typical stuff. And, uh, but, you know, there started being real friction between my dad and me, you know, after that. And uh, so finally my dad kicked me out and I did go live with my mother. And uh, she's Catholic, you know, and so she allowed me to go to church. And by the way, I, uh, there's one thing that happened with my dad, you know, because I started going to two different churches, you know, uh, that were close to my house. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I got baptized in one of them. And, but uh, somehow my dad found out about it. And he went to both churches and he said to them, he said, if my son comes here, I'm going to sue you guys. And both of those churches asked me not to come back. Wow. And that's wow. in America. Wow. Just to show you the impact of Muhammad, of Islam. Wow. Even in America, two churches asked me. And they said, you got to honor your father. You're only 15, you know. So uh, anyway, but I got, you know, I went to live with my mom. My mom let me go to church. And so I started looking for church and I went to like seven different churches until I found just the right one, you know, because I got saved under Paul Robertson. You know, I didn't want to go to some dead church. I wanted to go to church that had the Holy Spirit. So I went, found one. It was so awesome, and uh, I really grew in the Lord. And uh, uh, you know, I attended that church for like uh, ten years. And uh, I went to college. I became a journalist, you know, a reporter for a newspaper. And uh, but I always felt a calling, a responsibility to the Muslims. I kind of feel like you know, God. I was one of them, you know. I was one of them. I know how they feel. I know what they think about. It. I know how sincere they are. I know how wonderful they are. Most of them are such beautiful, innocent people. They're victims of this thing, you know? And uh, and so I wanted, uh, I, I had a desire somehow to go back and preach to the Muslims. So, uh, uh, you know, if I could, if, I don't know if you if you want to ask anything about anything or if you want me to just go ahead and jump to the when when I started uh, my mission trips and stuff. Uh, um, I think um, this is getting uh, really interesting. That um, um, I am actually speaking next week in a big conference in called Truth and Liberty, and I'm going to speak in regard to the topic. That you mentioned, brother, because um, I uh, I heard in America when I came here in America about 11 years ago for the first time I heard um, some preachers on TV, not on Christian television, but on like Fox or CNN or mainstream media. They would uh, quote the Bible and says that uh, we must obey the government, and uh, they would quote. Um, Romans chapter 13 verse 1 and 2 and um, if you apply that to my situation brother if if Apostle Paul really meant without reading the rest of it that that shows us uh, what a government meant to do what a government has been established to do by God if you read verse 1 and 2 of chapter 13 of the Romans makes sense we need to surrender to government. And if you apply that to my situation, it means, uh, according to the Islamic Sharia, apostasy is forbidden. It is illegal for Muslims to convert. So you apply that to my situation. I'm in Iran. I converted to Christianity. Okay. And then I read, according to these preachers in the West, and I'm reading Romans 13 and it says obey the government so I need to go back to the government renounce Christ and go back to the Islamic revert to the Islamic faith and then we read uh, verse 4 and 5 in the same chapter Apostle Paul says that the good a, a government is to is to reward the just and the righteous and to punish the evil doers. When the government does the exact exact opposite, Thomas Jefferson said, "It's the duty to rebel against such the government." Yeah. And um, I believe it's Saint Augustine that said, "An unjust law is no law at all." I mean, he told you when you make an unjust law, it, it's it's no law to be obeyed. So I understand uh, because um, this type of situations I have come across in America that um, some preachers sit on the thing and then they tell you obey the government and I'm like 
obey the government, all the Iranian believers, all the Afghan believers, that uh, Muslim background believers that they have left Islam, have came to faith. Now they have to renounce their faith to go back to what are you? What whatever you smoking ain't good. That's your exegesis of those passages. It ain't good. So uh, that is my comment in regard to those pastors that they need to grow a backbone. Yeah. The Iranian pastors are being um, killed and they're not renouncing Christ. So that is who we need to um, learn from. And then uh, the apostles that they wrote those passages themselves, they didn't obey the government. But uh, And they say uh, to the Sanhedrin, we obey uh, you or God. Which is so, mm -hmm. Go ahead, brothers. Uh, that was my uh, <laughs> little peep talk. Well, you know what? There, there's so much in what you just said there, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the rules of America don't apply in the Middle East, you know, and the, you know, the laws. And but it's, but what's interesting is that here in America, mm -hmm. you know, we had the situation a few years ago. There was a girl who, uh, who was. Muslim and raised in a, in a Muslim family, and her her she she became a Christian, and then she she fled from her family because she was afraid for her life. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting is the way CNN covered it. CNN would just said these wonderful parents are so wonderful and they're such good parents. They've never broken a law. They don't have speeding tickets. You know they're just so awesome. And she needs to come back to a beautiful family. They're saying they want to help and they want to you know and i'm just thinking you know what you you know the the americans don't understand the re a lot of a lot of them do but a lot of them don't especially the liberal variety don't mm -hmm. understand the real danger of islam this you're talking about a life and death situation yeah mohammed said whoever changes his religion kill him that's it Mohammed said it. If you want to, uh, uh, if you want to uh, whitewash it, if you want to say it's a historical thing, it's in a time of war. No, Mohammed said it, and mm, it's done. It's finished. Yeah, and, yeah. and I talked to so many Muslims in America about this, and they never. Oh, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of. <laughs> Is it really? Because every single Muslim in the Middle East knows that verse. They've memorized it. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> But in America, they've never heard of it before. Uh, what is that? Um, conveniently. <laughs> yeah, they never remember these type of verses. So, going back to your testimony, brother. So, tell us uh, what else happened in this journey yeah. of um, well, you know, the, Sunni Muslim coming to faith in Christ. So, tell us, brother. Well, you know, the I had a burden to go back to the Muslim. I wanted to reach out to Muslim. So, you know, I was a believer for almost 15 years before I ever touched the Quran. Mm -hmm. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I didn't want to go near it, you know, and uh, but I felt I, somehow I felt an obligation to go back. I, I had to do something for the Muslim because I kind of feel, you know what, I was born in America, I lived here, had a good life in America. I didn't have, I didn't know nothing about Islam. I didn't know nothing about Arabs. And I didn't want to know anything about it. You know, I was a comfortable American life and everything was great, you know. But somehow everything fell apart. My, my fam, family got, there was divorce. My dad takes us to the Middle East. And I could look back at all that stuff and say, you know, that all that stuff that happened to me, it was a kidnapping, it was a terrible situation, psychological issues and emotional problems and everything. But, or else I could look at it the way Joseph did. You know, Joseph looked back on his life and he had it a lot rougher than we do. And he, and you know, when his brother sold him into Egypt and he said, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Mm -hmm. And you know, the good was that he was gonna feed his brother. He was gonna save their lives, the lives of the ones who did that to him. And I felt, you know, all that stuff that happened to him because of all that stuff, I'd know his life. Because of that stuff, I, I speak Arabic. Because of that stuff, I read Arabic. I know the Quran. I learned it in school, for, you know, for three years when I was there. And so I've got something that I can use to reach the Muslims. I, I, I felt I, 
I have a responsibility to do that, you know? And uh, and I know you know what I'm talking about. You know, I know you have that, that same passion to reach the Muslim. And, and so uh, when I was in 1993, the Lord opened the door for me to go to a mission, even though I, I was working as a reporter at a newspaper. Mm -hmm. But I, I really felt called to go to, uh, it was Bosnia. You know, there was a war in Bosnia, between Croatia and Bosnia. And I wanted, and I heard that they were persecuting the Muslims on the news. And when I heard that, I just felt, I want to go there. I want to go talk to them. And, and I, I had a chance, the Lord two times opened the door for me to actually go there and, uh, and, and to be able to preach, you know, to share the gospel with them. Some of them came to the Lord. You know, there's like two, you know, two girls that, you know, we had gone to. Uh, I was with a team and we used to minister at the school, you know. And so, uh, you know, the Lord opened the door and that's the first time. I was and then I, 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 I had lots of problems with my family because of, of doing that. But I knew what the Lord wanted me to do. And I love what, you're, what you said about leaving your father's that's we really are doing that. We have to leave our father's house, just like God said to Abraham, leave your father's. Mm -hmm. You have to. If you want to follow God, you gotta leave your father's home. Okay? And and so uh, in nineteen ninety nine the Lord opened the door for me to actually go back to the Holy Land. You know, and I I actually went to uh I didn't go to my village because I knew what would happen <laughs> if I'd went there. Well, and uh, I didn't want to cause problems for my family because my family's there. And, you know, and, and uh, but I went to a village, uh, to a city near my village. Okay, it, and I went there, and what I started doing is I started going out on the street and talking to ten people every day. I just want to tell them about Jesus, you know. And I know what Muslims are going to say. You tell them Jesus died. He said, they're going to say, Masala Buma Katalu, like a They did not kill him or crucify him, it was made to appear so. You tell me he's the son of God, they're going to say, Lem Yelet with a mule, you know, God has no son. You know, I know exactly what they're going to say every time. But the word of God is a seed, and it's a powerful seed. You plant it in the heart and you just leave it there. Let the Holy Spirit, and maybe the Holy Spirit will do with them what he did to me, you know. And our job isn't to convert people, it's to plant the seed. One plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. But we have to plant the seed. If there's no seed, there's no harvest. We have to plant the seed. And so that's what I was out doing. I just was planting the seed. I knew what they're going to say. But I, that's what I was doing. So I was out on the streets. Every day I would go talk to 10 people. And one day I went to a mosque. And I stood outside a mosque <laughs> in Ramallah. This is next to Jerusalem. And I just stop and talk to the and i want to talk to the imam and stuff and uh, they talk to me very nice you know and then but a few days later i get a phone call and in the phone call you know they tell me we're giving you two hours to to leave town if you don't we're going to come get you and uh and so i you know jesus said if they persecute you in one town go to the next you know, so I went to the next town. The next town is Jerusalem, you know, because it's right next to there. So I went there, and I just want to say there was there was two guys who came to the church that I attended. I wasn't there when this happened, but there was two guys who came to the church that I was I was the worship leader of the church, you know, and this is where I was attending when I lived in that city, and they're the two guys who spoke to my pastor there, and they said. Uh, tell Hussein he needs to leave or we're going to go get him. These two guys said, and these guys both had blood on their hands. But I want to tell you what, a few years later, both of those guys got saved and baptized. Hallelujah. And they said, they said the one that we hurt the most is the one who helped them. Mm -hmm. You know, when they kicked me out of the city and stuff. So, Anyway, I had to go to Jerusalem. I went to Jerusalem and uh, and I started ministering there. You know, I, I'd start going to the mosque. I'd go in front of the mosque and I just would sit in front and then I'd wait for some people, somebody to come out and I'd start talking to them about the Lord. One day, I uh, one day I was sitting in front of a mosque 
in, 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 in Jerusalem, and I had a bag of Bible, and it was a Friday during the prayer, and I was sitting out there on this on the fence waiting for the prayer to end, and a guy, this huge guy, comes out and says, "How come you're not in, in praying with us?" And I said, "Well, I'm not a Muslim." <laughs> And he, he grabbed my collar and, and he said, well, you're going to become one today. <laughs> and he started slapping me and touching me. And, and as he was hitting me on the street, this guy from inside the mosque sees him hitting me. And he's got fire in his eyes. He wanted to kill me. He starts running towards us. And when he started running towards us, I broke free of this guy and I ran. You know, as fast as I could, I bolted and went to the old city. You know, <laughs> and you know, and I had several situations like that. You know, where that would happen, and you know, I went to uh, I went to Jerusalem. You know, and then I was also in another city, and it's the city where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, same thing happened there, and uh, and then. Uh, you know, I, I stayed in Jerusalem for two years, and let me just give you, you know, I'm telling you all these bad stories, but let me just tell you a good story that happened there in Jerusalem. Uh, one night after church, I went to visit this friend. Uh, he wasn't a friend. He was, we just went to with a friend to go drink coffee at this restaurant. And there was a guy who was uh, serving us the coffee, and, uh, and he was a Muslim. Very nice guy. Sat down, talked to us. We said we were just in church, and you know, we, uh, we talked about Jesus. He said, "Sure." He said, and he had a picture of Jesus in his wallet. You know, he just really loved Jesus, even though he's a Muslim. He loved Jesus. And I told him my testimony. I said, "You know, the Holy Spirit came to me. And Jesus was there." <laughs> and uh, and and I said, "Would you like to receive the Lord?" And he said, "No, I'm a Muslim, but I love Jesus." And I said, "Okay, well, you know." And I gave him my phone number, and you know, and and. And, and then I didn't hear from him for about seven months. And then after about seven months, he called me and he said to me, I said, and I said, yeah, he says, uh, in Arabic, you know, I'll just tell you what he said in Arabic. He said, that means the one who came to you came to me. And, you know, it's like, whoa. I, you know, it's too good to be true. It's like, so I changed the subject. How's your wife? How's your kids? You know, how's your brother? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. The one that came to you came to me too. I'm not here to tell you about my wife or kids or family. I'm here about, I'm here to tell you about the one. That's exactly what he said. I know. He said, no, the one who came to you came to me. I said, Jesus? Yes. He said he was sitting in the kitchen and he was so depressed. He was so, uh, you know, he, he's married, got kids and everything. And he said he was looking out the window and he saw a light. And he said he felt the peace that he knew about And he knew it was Jesus. And so, you know, God does this with Muslims. You know, God does this with Muslims. And it's, it's you know, there's, you know, they did a study of how do Muslims come to the Lord. The number one way, number one, is internet. Like, praise be to God for the internet. Number two is like they knew a Christian at some point in their life. Number three, they heard a, a Bible verse or something. But it, what well, you know, but number four is dreams and visions and miracles. God does this for Muslims, and and so you know, you know, when I hear about this. It makes me think. Um, it makes me think that uh, uh, you know, there's a, a verse in, in the book of Isaiah where God says, "I looked for someone to intercede, and I couldn't find anybody, so I just rolled up my sleeves and I did it myself." And I kind of feel like with Muslim evangelism, for so long the church has been neglect ne negligent about evangelizing the Muslims for fear, political correctness, or whatever. But you know what? It's like God just said, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. And he is doing it himself. He's pouring out his spirit on the Muslims in a way that is 
I mean, it's so many miracles, so many dreams, so many visions. And, and it's happening, you know, it's happened to so many people that I know. And I know, I know this has happened with people you know, you know, and with yourself, mm -hmm. you know. And so, uh, so anyway, that, you know, that was one of my, uh, that was like one of my sons in the Lord, you know, from that whole ministry time with all the problems that happened there, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Lord, you know, the Lord gave me that one son, you know, that, uh, that encouraged me to keep going. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that, I moved to another city. Uh, it, it, it's called Gaza. I don't, I'm sure you've heard about it. They're very, uh, they like Iran a lot there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, I mean, they like the Iranian government. Yes. They they, like um, the if, you, uh, if you ask your wife or any Iranians, there was a, there, there's a slogan, there's a chanting that goes on when the Iranians are protesting the Islamic regime of Iran. They say, no uh, Gaza, no Lebanon. Oh. My life sacrifice for Iran. They say na Gaza na Lebanon, John am fadai Iran. So that's um, um wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of the one of the Islamic regime's favorite place and one of the uh, most disliked places by the Iranian people with the Persians. Wow. <laughs> I, I I don't want to hurt any anybody's feelings, okay? But no, I hate to do that. <laughs> but I, but I but I hate to tell you this. The Sunnis think the Shiites are a bunch of Catholics. I hate to tell you this. Sorry, you guys. They think yeah. you're a bunch, but they love your money. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> they love Hassan Nasrallah because he's the only reason they like him is because he's fighting Israel for them. So. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, but they should read Psalm 83 because it talks about Gaza and Lebanon. But anyway, some other time for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, but when I was down there, um, I I got a chance also to minister, and um, I, the Lord opened so many doors for me to be able to minister. And I lived there for six years in the Gaza Strip until you know uh, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, and then I left, uh, and I had to leave, you know, because uh, there was there was danger on my life and. Uh, so, but while I was there, so many miracles happened. So many times, you know, and I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you uh, one of them. You know, I had a friend who, uh, I had a friend that, uh, that, uh, that used to help the deaf and the mute. Mm -hmm. And he was a Muslim, wonderful young man. And, uh, and I used to, uh, I used to tell him about the Lord, and and I used to go and work with the deaf and the mute, and and I would go and visit, and visit the deaf and the mute. I would go visit them and try to learn their sign language, try to talk to them, you know, and you know, to try to help them, maybe bring food or something like that. And uh, and what and uh, and while I was there at their uh, at the club with the deaf and the mute. One time I lost my telephone because I lost my telephone. Uh, I got a new telephone and the new telephone had a new number and, and the number was 066-438-356-0000. Uh, uh, and, and I had a real hard time remembering that number 438 because when I was a kid, I lived at 348 Sunset Street. When I was an adult, I lived at 843 Cortez Street. So I had all these combinations of that number. And every time I would tell somebody my phone number, I'd give them the wrong order of numbers. I couldn't remember 438. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look up Isaiah 438 and see what it says. And so I looked up Isaiah 438. It says, lead out those who have ears but cannot hear. And this is when I'm working with the deaf. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited. I felt like God was talking to me. And I told my friends in America. And my friend in America said, look at the first part of your phone number, 356. Isaiah 356. 
says the tongue of the mute shall sing because a river has broke forth in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Both conditions, mute and deaf. And I kept on working with those people. And I just want to tell you, the Holy Spirit did some amazing things there. We prayed for people. Some of them, their ear. I had some one person whose ear was open. I had people who had dreams about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I had people. One guy, one guy, he came over to my house uh, with some friends of his, and he was uh, sleeping on the floor, you know, like in the Middle East, everybody sleeps on the floor. And and in the morning, in the morning, he says to his friends, he says, uh, which one of you came to me last night? You know, because he was at five of his friends who were sleeping over too. And his friend said, we didn't come to you last night. He said, no, no, one of you came to me last night. And I said, no, we did it. And he said, yeah, no, one of you came to me. You were wearing a white gown and you said to me, I am the awaited Messiah. Which one of you did that? Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and, and, you know, so stuff like this happens, you know, and it happened many times. And uh, so to just get to where I am now, I'm not gonna, I know I've talked a lot, but the- Please, please keep talking, we like it. Okay. You know, one thing that happened when I was in in the Middle East is that I, I found out about the power of Christian television, Christian Arabic television, because everybody knew Father Zechariah. Everybody knew him and hated him. <laughs> <laughs> they hated him, but they had to watch him. They couldn't help watching him, you know. And he was causing an earthquake in the Muslim world. And so, uh, sure. in, in 2011, I came back to America. And through just a series of events, the Lord opened the door for me to meet Father Zechariah. Wow. And uh, I actually... He asked me to work with him on his television station, and uh, I started actually doing TV shows with him. Uh, and I had a TV show on his program. It was called mm -hmm. Message of Grace in English, where I, you know, I preached the gospel and talked about Islam and uh, various aspects of Islam. And these were live programs. And I also did Arabic live programs with Father Zechariah, where I'd interview him. You know, for his, uh, he had a, like a, a Friday show and the Monday show, and so I would be like the host for that. And so I didn't know nothing about Father Zechariah. I didn't know nothing about Christian television or its impact in the Middle East, but having lived there, I knew the power of media in preaching the gospel. And I was saved through television. Mm -hmm. I was saved watching television. So mm -hmm. I believe in media, I believe in TV preachers, even if they're, even, no matter who it is, they're, if they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul said some people preach for the wrong reason because they're greedy. Whatever, I don't care, Paul said. As long as they're preaching the gospel, the gospel is powerful. And so, and then God opened the door for me to start being on television with Father Zechariah, you know. He's got a $60 million price on his head, you know, for, for his ministry. And the Lord opened that door for me, you know. And so, uh, anyway... So, you know, I, I'm no longer doing the TV programs, but, you know, now I just, I do my uh, YouTube channel and, uh, and I go to churches. I, I, I mean, uh, I go to mosques <laughs> and uh, I stand outside with a big wooden cross and I try to preach to Muslims as they're leaving. They, they, they say, dude, you're insane. You're crazy. You're so stupid. Can't believe you're doing something. You're such an idiot. Mm -hmm. You're 80 years old and you're standing out here in the sun with the big cross. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? When they say that, it makes me want to do it more. You know, we've only got a few days down here to get them to turn their eyes towards Jesus Christ. We've got a few days to get them to turn their eyes towards Jesus Christ. And if they don't, they're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I... I I, I started doing my ministry on YouTube and on Facebook, and it caused an earthquake in my village in the Middle East. It caused an earthquake in my. I had so many relatives begging me, "Please stop! You're 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 
You're embarrassing your family. You're embarrassing all of us. And I was doing it in Arabic and in English. And you know what? One day I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then I, I, I took a nap. And when I took a nap, I heard a voice inside of me. And it was crying. And the voice said, I have to keep talking. I have to keep talking. We can't silence the gospel. Satan doesn't shut up in his desire to take people to hell. We have to not shut up in our desire to reveal the truth to them about Muhammad, about Islam, and most important, about who Jesus Christ really is. And so that's kind of what I'm doing these days. And uh, so. But I'll say, uh, what, how, how people got, uh, can get a hold of you? What's, what's the Facebook? What is the, um, uh, of course, I have uh, left it in the description of the video, but can you tell us how to, how people to get a hold of you or your ministry? Or uh, I believe you're in Southern California. Yes. And, uh, you know, they have the, uh, they have the, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my YouTube channel, which is Hussein Mashni. Mm -hmm. And I, I do programs on there almost every night, you know, uh, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock here in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do programs there almost every night. And I do, it's about Islam. Right now I'm doing a series about the wives of Muhammad, mm -hmm. uh, all 13 of them. So <laughs> we're up to number seven tonight. So if you'd like to watch it. <laughs> and uh you know and just uh and we're um and then i also have my uh um my facebook which is uh also hussein mashni mm -hmm. and so people can contact me through there they can come to my program on youtube it's a live program usually at 10 o'clock california time mm -hmm. and uh so yeah we welcome them and uh and um, I got a question for you. It is um, first of all to the audience. Thank you for watching. And if you have any question uh, re in regard to the subject, to the topic that we're talking about, please post it. I'll ask uh, Brother Hussein. But um, since it's my show, brother, I'm going to ask you a few questions. <laughs> sure. um, so um, when uh, uh, there is another thing that is uh, I have heard. Um, Going back to the uh, churches that they told you, uh, you have to honor your father and mother, not come back here. Um, I want to uh, ask you a question, because I faced that many times, especially in the beginning of my ministry. Um, why you bother with Islam? Why you um, talk about Islam? Just keep it uh, Christ-centered. Just keep it clean. What's What's the big fuss about Islam? Just just try to, I mean, it, it's just a good religion. You, if you want to preach the gospel, more, you're more than welcome to, but never talk about Islam. What would you, to, what would you tell to the people that have that kind of, um, my maybe questions or uh, objections to us? Well, you, you know, uh, I thank God for everything everybody's doing. I like, I, like, I like the people that just, that don't talk about Islam, you know, and just talk about, the gospel. I, I thank God for those guys. I thank God for, but the problem with Islam is that Islam is a polemical religion. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that, it it attacks all the basic Christian doctrines. Mm -hmm. it, it is an a, a, a frontal attack on Christianity. How it says Jesus is not the Son of God. Well, how you know. That is an attack. You know, they can say, oh, we're peaceful. We love, we respect Muhammad. I mean, and Jesus, and we love Jesus more than you, you know? And you know, they're, they're, that's why they're putting their book tables in, in, in America's universities saying, we love Jesus. That's their book tables are called, we love Jesus. Yeah, and, seen it. Yeah. What, I'm sorry? I have seen it too. Yeah. <laughs> and in the malls and people, oh, you love Jesus? Really, you love Jesus? But yeah, and we believe in one God. Oh, we believe in one God too. Oh, we're just, this. you know, I don't know. There's a famous singer. Her name is Sinead O'Connor, and she died a few weeks ago. But she was she was really crazy. But then she became a Muslim, started wearing the hijab, and kept on singing. And and they were asking her, "What made you 
a Muslim. And she said, you know, the neat thing about Islam is that I don't have to leave my Christianity. I can still believe my Christianity and Islam is the last religion. That's it, you know, but I still get to believe what I want. They're lying to people about what Islam is. You know, people think that, oh, we love Jesus too. Oh, really? So we love Jesus too. You guys, and so we have to, number one, we have to educate the church. We have to educate the church, you know, the Christians and the church. You know, we have to educate Christians about about the Trinity. We have to educate, because Christians don't know. How are Muslims going to know about when Christians don't know about it? Christians don't know about the deity of Christ. Christians don't know about the dual nature of Jesus Christ. So many of them don't know. And then when a Muslim, when they're confronted with Islam, which is a polemical religion, like the Jehovah, very similar to the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, which attacks the basic foundational doctrines of the Bible. And so that we have to, you know, the Bible says, demolishing arguments, mm -hmm. you know, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, and if we if we shut up, the devil doesn't shut up. Never. Yeah. So we have to end the Muslims. I tell you what, man, they're taking advantage of the, of, of the ignorance of a lot of Christians. And, you know, a lot of Christians, you know, one thing I hear in America is like, oh, I don't want to force my kids to go to church. You know, I want them to choose for themselves. Well, the Muslims are out there to help your kids choose, you know, they're there to help your kids choose. You know, you force your kids to go to school. Why can't you force them to go to church? You know, and anyway, so. So the other question that I have, of course, um, uh, in the beginning, um, I was wondering what, where this idea comes from that uh, we shouldn't talk about Islam. And uh, if supposedly we keep it Christ centered, um, we win more people to the Lord. And, uh, um, you know, it's it's really pretty to sit on the side of the line and tell the uh, people that are running, you tell them how to run. It is, it is pretty. But um, when, you, when you come and start running and you face the stuff that we face constantly as ministers to Muslims, starting from families and relatives and then it goes to friends and then other people, strangers, most Muslims that we, um, we, we meet on the streets, you present the best case for Christ. I mean, you come up with the most elegant presentation of the gospel. In the Muslim mind, at the end of the day, that is ready, but I have the best religion. I have the concealed, the concealment, the culmination, the perfect. So, in their eyes, Christ, Jesus, Isa came and failed because he failed Allah had to send another one to complete the failure of Jesus the failure of Moses and so on and so forth so no matter how beautiful the, the case for Christ is at the end of the day since they have the best thing in their mind they were they're thinking okay whatever thank you but when you start talking about Islam and showing what Islam actually is, for example, many verses in the Quran, many hadiths, Muhammad didn't know what is going to happen to him. Muhammad is the mouthpiece of Allah. Muhammad doesn't know what is going to happen to him. How does he know what is going to happen to you? And if the mouthpiece doesn't know what is going to happen to him, the mouthpiece of Allah doesn't know. Does it mean that Allah doesn't know what is going to happen to you? And then when you show them that the names of Allah, for example, oh, Allah is mutakabir, is the arrogant, is the prideful. You show them that uh, Allah is the khair, khair al-makareen, is the chief of the deceivers. How could you trust the chief of the deceivers, the greatest of the deceivers for your salvation, for your eternal life? You can't. When you start talking to Muslim about major issues such as this in the religion, now the value of the religion falls down, then you have a space to speak to them in, in regard to Christ. If you don't get this, you won't get what we're doing and why, why the ex-Muslims are so effective in the preaching of the gospel. 
because um, I know um, many times, Brother Hussein, when we walk the streets and we're talking to Muslims, oh, have you heard about Christ? They say, oh, I'm not Armenian. I'm not, uh, we're not Asuris, we're not Armenian. The, in their mind, you think they're from the, and then you say, no, my name is Muhammad. I was born and raised a Muslim. I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. I converted to, then they, they want to know why. Because, the, because in their mind, no Muslim converts. Islam is so beautiful and perfect and delicious that you don't go get something else. So, that is uh, out my reason that I will keep talking about Islam. I will keep talking about uh, their religion, their faith, and the flaws and the holes in their, in their faith. That they open up to start listening about other things, which at the end of the day, at the end of the, uh, uh, the road, is going to be Christ. It, the goal is Christ. How I get you there doesn't matter. I will talk to talk to you about Christ. So, um, the other question that I have for you is: You're a Sunni Muslim from Palestine, and you married a Shia Muslim from Iran. So, and you both converted to Christianity. I mean, when when the when the Sunnis tell, oh, Shias are not Muslims. Oh, okay, you converted. I mean, uh, I you got the combination now. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, my uh, my wife is not an ex-Muslim. She's a she's a, um, she's from a Christian background. Praise the Lord! Even yeah, better. She's not. Yeah, she's not. Uh, she's not a, a a Shiite. Yeah, but she's yeah she is from Iran though. So. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I wanted to say I wanted to say something about what you were talking about the last thing you said. Uh, specifically about the uh about you know why the polemics using the polemics with islam you know you guys the muslims are being lied to and we have to tell them the truth and one of the lies that i know i was taught from day one is you know and i already talked about this is that there's only one quran it's perfectly preserved the bible's been corrupted the the torah has been corrupted but nobody can change or or do anything to the quran well, we know that's not true now. We know there's so many different brands. And we, you know, I was a believer for like 40 years before I heard about this, that there's all these different brands. And it was on Father Zechariah's program where he put the different Korans on the table in front of everybody. And I t even though I'd been a believer for 40 years, when I saw that, it still shook me up inside because we're so program that there's only one perfect Allah preserved Quran they need to know this too they need to know that there's all these different Qurans they're all different from each other and that they've all been corrupted they've all been changed and so you know we have response you know they're being lied to the shifts uh, in their schools in their mosques are still telling them there's only one Quran they're being lied to and they're going to hell with this belief because of this belief and so you know this is one reason why we have to tell them the truth we have to show them the truth we have the evidence you know we have the evidence and we can show it to them from their books so you know that's i just want to say that about you know the last thing that you mm -hmm. that's awesome praise the lord so um Brother, uh, if I have many Muslims that uh, troll my channel, they um, comment, they, they're watching right now, uh, what would you tell them? Um, what, uh, what's your message for them? Yeah. You know, you guys, you know, my, I, know, I know a lot of the trolls because they come to my channel too, and I know lots of, <laughs> you know, and, I, I, you know, you, you guys, we're, we're, we're risking our lives do this we're risking our lives to, to, because we want to get this message to you you know and and because you're gonna go to hell and, and you know like what what, uh, what our brother just said that Muhammad said in the Quran chapter 46 verse 9 I don't know what's gonna happen to me or you why do you want to follow someone when he doesn't know where he's going he doesn't know where he's going and you want to follow that person? He says, I don't know what's going to happen to me or you. Why do you want to follow him if he doesn't know? Look at what Jesus said. 
to the thief on the cross next to him. He says, truly, truly, I tell you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Jesus knows where he's going and he knows how to take you there. Amen. He said it plainly. Muhammad also said it plainly. He says, I don't know where I'm going. If I go to heaven or hell, I don't know. And I don't know where you're going. It's just like, really? So what's at least make a promise that you're going to take us to heaven. <laughs> you know, but he, he's very honest. He says, no, I don't know. I don't know where, I, where you're going or where you're going or where I'm going. And so you guys, you don't even need to listen. Just go read your book. Go read chapter 46. Nine. Look at what kind of assurance we mm -hmm. We were just like you. We were just like you guys. We would have been trolls on somebody else's channel too if God hadn't changed us, you know. But yeah. God made this change in us, and He wants to give you this peace. He wants to give you this joy. And I know some of you guys, you know what I mean when I say that when I was a Muslim, I was so empty. I was so full of hatred and anger and hopelessness. But when Jesus came, and he wants to do that for you. He wants to give you that life. Amen. Amen. And uh, uh, last but not, not the least, brother, what would you tell to all the wonderful believers, all the wonderful Christians that are watching this program? What would you tell them? Um, how would you encourage them to get involved? And, uh, and uh, you, know, you, you know, I was reading the, I was reading the, I was reading at something or listening to some program the other day and uh, and this guy said that he started a church and he he went out and he put food for the poor he did stuff did all this stuff to try to reach people and nobody came to his church and and they said you know the this person uh, he talked to uh, this preacher I, I can't remember I think he told us, a really great preacher like in the 1800s he said, you know, I've tried all these things and none of it's work. You know, do you have any advice for me? And uh, and he said, I got two words for you. Try tears. Try tears. Try crying. Pray and cry for these people. Let God break your heart. Let God break your heart for these people. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to. God so loved the Muslims that he gave his only son, that if they would believe him, they'll not go to hell. But if they don't believe, they're gonna go to hell. And the devil has put all these roadblocks in front of them. Try letting that break your heart, you know, because that's what, you know, Jesus' heart was broken. You know, it says that when he's on the cross, it says, uh, you know, when the blood and water came out, that, that shows that his heart grew because of the immensity of the pain. He died of a broken heart for the sinful world. We have to have a broken heart. We have to love these people and 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 cry for them and pray, God, please touch them. Pour out your spirit on them. You know, and I said this, let me just say this real quickly, that with my village, I started doing this. The reaction from my village was so vicious. It was vicious. It hurt. It was so painful from my relatives, from my family. But you know, one thing I, that I kept noticing is that every day somebody in my village died. Every day someone in my village died. And when they died, they went to hell. Mm -hmm. And so I have a responsibility to keep them until maybe somebody's going to hear. Maybe they're not going to hear because of my words. So don't stop talking and don't stop praying, crying. Ask God to give you his heart for the most. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Brother Hussein. This was such an awesome time to spend with you and uh, hear your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, how the Lord has touched your life, changed it. And uh, uh, to all of the viewers, to all of the people who are watching or going to listen or going to watch, uh, subscribe, be part of this channel, share this uh, program, share this episode with other people. And uh, till next. God bless you, and um, please share the gospel. If you have Muslim colleagues, uh, students, 
I mean, you, they're, they're everywhere. You cannot be anywhere in the world, in the Western world or in the East, that there are no Muslims. Please share the gospel with them. Tell them what the Lord Jesus has done for them. And then uh, then uh, when they convert, I will have them on this program. God bless you. Have a great day. Or my program.